Twitch. Let me get uh, an audio check for Twitch real quick. <coughs> not sure why it thinks I'm offline. I'm certainly not. People coming up. I hear noise everywhere. Okay. For some reason, Twitch is still not showing us as online. There we go. Oop, I heard myself. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, I am ready when you are. <clears throat> okay, let me get my last drink. Okay, 2.23. Okay, you ready? Yep, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 223 of the In 30 Podcast. I'm Haim Cohen. Uh, Tom is there. Right here. There. There. Okay. And actually, we have a lot of stories to talk about this week. I know we were in here last week, but surprisingly, a whole lot of little things hit like like right, right after the other. Again, join our WhatsApp group. We will... All the stories go there. We talk about them. You have any questions, we're right there to help. So find us. We'll talk about it. But I guess our first story is, and I just lost it. Um, I just literally lost it. WhatsApp users urged to update as hackers break into phones by sending them. Oh, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, and it, what's it's a GIF? Yes, it is a GIF. It is not a, a GIF. GIF. I do not care what the creator of the GIF <laughs> said. It is not a GIF. It's a GIF. I can't. So once he said how to pronounce it, I don't remember what I said beforehand. So back in the mid nineties, I don't remember what I said. So I do say GIF all the time, and then he said GIF, and I'm like, uh, I don't think yeah. so. But you, I guess you do you. Sorry, I mean, you it's didn't... not. It's not yeah. graphics uh, interchange format. It's graphics interchange <laughs> format. G GIF. It's all about the GIF. One of, one of my favorite people on Twitter, John Syracuse, always said, if you're doing something that has an ambiguous name, always, like, always per, uh, provide a pronunciation. So, any like, in 30, that's how you say in 30. I don't think we need to provide a pronunciation for it, but there you go. Same thing. So, if you come up with something, an app or a name or whatever it is, always pr put a pronunciation for people and don't come out 20 years later and say it's been said wrong the entire time. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, WhatsApp had a flaw that you send a gift to that person and uh, they would be hacked. I mean, that's really it. But basically update. But just FYI, you should be updating. Yeah, it's it's just another. I mean, we, we see this a whole lot with uh, various media formats where. You know, because media is quite literally being interpreted and executed on the device that any time that there's a vulnerability in that media parser, uh, it can lead to a wider exploit chain that could compromise your entire application, if if not the entire device, if the device's security isn't you know, quite up to snuff. Um, you know, back in the day, and I'm not sure if it's that way today still, um, Android's media parser actually ran uh, under system privileges. Uh, so if you broke the media parser, you got full root access to the system. Nothing could stop you. Um, I believe that's been fixed, but don't quote me on that. Well, like you said, I was about to bring that up. If you're running an interpreter, if somebody's going to try and and mess around with it. And you, I mean, you have to remember, uh, iOS had a flaw a few years ago where you send some weird random string of characters and it crashed the phone. And all my students would send each other this thing to crash the phone. I mean, so 
So WhatsApp is trying to be really user friendly and make it easy to send all these things. But there will be somebody who's going to put some blank header at the top that's going to cause a crash. And the good thing is WhatsApp fixed it right away and you should update. I mean, if you said for automatic updates, this shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, that's so by the time I saw this story, uh, WhatsApp had already updated itself on my phone and I didn't need to check anything. It just I looked and I was like, oh. That's nice. It updated. I, so, I didn't even know until after I read the story of the reason why. I mean, I, if I had to take a guess, I would have figured that's exactly what it was. Usually, like you said, all these things are interpreters. They're taking pictures. They're taking a lot of media. And they're trying to make it in line, embedded, all that stuff for people to see. And it makes sense. So I don't think there's any more on that except for the fact that just keep on updating your stuff. Yeah, that's about it. Next story. Twitter admits two-factor login phone numbers were used for advertising. So this so when you give uh Twitter your two-factor code, they one of the you can give your S, your number as an SMS thing and they would they would SMS you the code to type in as your two-factor and turns out they were using that to sell ads against Facebook did this a few years ago, or not a few years ago, uh, about six months ago. They got caught, and it was a big deal. Twitter actually just came out and said, oops, we're sorry. I think that's the best they can do. Uh, yeah. Now, you know wh whether you believe this is inadvertent or not, uh, and I, I personally do, um, this stuff happens. Uh, user databases are out there, and when you're trying to sell ads, you know you go to the the source of truth. And you're like, oh, cool! Look at all this data on our users. We can sell ads against this stuff. Um, not knowing that some of those fields might be protected or pri privileged or other things, and this this might sound, um, you know, potentially evil through through negligence, but it happens because people just don't think about it. Um, so yeah, uh, that said, since this happened, um, Twitter could have either, you know, put out put out an internal email and said, "Hey, everybody, hush about this. It's Twitter confidential. Uh, this doesn't go outside the company. Uh, you know, we don't want bad press on us. You know, stuff like that." But they didn't. Instead, they told everyone and they said, "Hey, we messed up. We're sorry. This might have happened." So we do need to have an episode on how to use Google Voice to do these two-factor codes correctly. Somebody did a, a workaround that basically said, use Google Voice on a, whatever, a throwaway Gmail account or a Gmail account that you use or just a Google account and don't give that number anybody and use that only as it because you can't, you can't do an I guess you can do an SS7 exploit, but you can't get fished on that. Like they can't SIM swap that because you have full control over it. That's going to be good for another another day. But it's one of those things that if you're listening to the show, we highly recommend moving off SMS uh, two-factor. If you're trying to explain to somebody what two-factor is, SMS, as we're going to talk about in a second, is probably better than anything else because it is a second factor. So if you're if you know what you're doing, it's time to move off of SMS and try to disable anywhere that has it. But if you want to just dip your toe with two factor, SMS right now is still the way to go. Yeah, it's it's by far one of the lowest uh, barriers to entry as far as two factor authentication systems go. But uh, you're exactly right. It's just it's not it's not safe. Um, you know, is are you going to be more hackable? if you do set up SMS two-factor authentication. Personally, I think not. Uh, the jury's still out on that, and some people think that, yeah, due to password reset workflows, you might actually be increasing your risk. But uh, frankly, it would have to be a very targeted attack. And if you're not going to be a targeted person, right, if you're not a celebrity or a politician or you know a local business leader with a, you know, a lot of people trying to go after you, I, you're probably not going to be spearfished in that kind of way. So, I mean, Microsoft just announced basically what Google announced, I don't know, a few months ago. Basically, uh, if you have any sort of two-factor, including SMS, phishing attempts went down to basically zero, which means that it's it's the number of, like you said, spear phishing is probably there. But for the most part, 
99.9% of people were not hacked if they had any sort of two-factor, even SMS. So while we talk about it as a bad thing, in reality, if you have it, it's way better than just nothing. Yeah, for sure. So, so that's I mean that's with the two factor. Uh, let's see, we're just going right through these. This is gonna this is gonna take a while. So the FBI, uh, what is this? Today is we're recording on Thursday. Probably on Tuesday was slapped by I guess federal judges saying they used the FISA courts to steal Americans' information and. I, I don't know what the punishment w- is other than telling everybody. I I just have to say, I am completely and utterly surprised by this news. You're telling me that data that the National Security Agency has illegally obtained on American citizens that they swore up and down couldn't no way, no how be used against American citizens was actually used against American citizens by another, um, you know, locally uh, jurisdicted uh, law enforcement agency. There's, this is utterly confounding to me. I am completely flabbergasted right now. I, at a loss for words, even. Okay, so I've been I've been looking through a lot of at least tweet threads on this. So hopefully I say this right. I mean, we put a link here from The Verge basically saying what we're going to say, but let's go a little in depth. So so first off, there's a couple of things. First is the FISA court. That's the super secret judge of panels who who uh, the FBI or the NSA or somebody goes to and says, we need to do surveillance on them. And the FISA court will say yes or yes or no. And this is completely private. You are not allowed to discuss it. Let's say Twitter gets something, give us the data. Twitter can't talk about it. The courts can't, nobody can talk about this. They can't give you a heads up. Usually these companies push back, but for whatever reason, these are under lock and seal until something happens where it comes out. So that's the first step. Uh, Second step is... um, The second step is we gather, the CIA gathers or the NSA gathers foreign intelligence. So if they're targeting someone not from the United States, they're, I mean, they're in their full power to do whatever they want. The problem is that as they grab contact, so let's say they're trying to wiretap a phone call, if they're taping an American, that they're not allowed to do that without a warrant. They have to essentially throw, right, throw that stuff out. Okay. Yeah, Tom's exactly. saying, yeah. So they have to throw that stuff out, but of course they don't. And I mean, I mean, if you th- thought that they did, I mean, I have a bridge to sell you, but basically they have to throw that out. And so, and so then what happened is the FBI came knocking and said, Hey, uh, now remember the FBI is an American uh, counterintelligence. They're going after American threats. So they're going to the NSA and say, Hey, uh, do you have this information? And the and the NSA says, yeah, but you kind of need a warrant for that. And they were just, they I don't want to say they were they. There was no warrant given, so people they were just getting it, and they were supposed to come up with like real proof that why they needed it and everything else. But they weren't doing it. They were just abusing the FISA court that no one knows how it works or who's on it or anything else, and getting this information and using it against Americans that they weren't supposed to have in the first place. I think I pretty much summed it up. So, like this, this is basically a a system where you can go and throw a bunch of selectors, a bunch of uh, queries uh, against a massive database of illegally acquired spy information. Um, and they had a little spot in there that said, "Hey, um, go ahead and put in like your warrant ID, just just a CYA. Put in your warrant ID, but it's it's an optional field. You don't have to fill it out." So what the FBI did is they just didn't fill that part out for a whole bunch of stuff. Um, people apparently, uh, according to the the court docket, they were looking up uh, spouses, ex-spouses, uh, romantic interests, friends, family members, celebrities. Um, uh, you name it, they were looking up people. Um, if you had a top secret database of everybody's personal secrets and phone calls, of course you would use it. Um, I, this this is kind of funny um, because the government swore up and down when uh, this smaller, lesser known leaker named Edward Snowden uh, literally said the exact same thing I'm saying now, uh, that government agencies were looking up 
yeah lovers ex-wives friends and family uh you know uh, political people just to do it just for funsies right and everyone's like no they would never do that these are staunch professionals uh and now it comes out in the court paperwork that yeah quite literally everything edward edward snowden said yeah that's the case and well i'm, so I'm the- super surprised this is my surprised face I mean, here's the underlying problem. Do we trust the FBI? Do we not trust the FBI? Like, I mean, I listen to TV. I listen to whatever the the, main, the evil mainstream media. They tell me I can't trust the FBI. Then on the other hand, they're like, the FBI is the best we got. They're stopping crimes. They're doing this. They're catching people on their way out of Dulles today with no return ticket back. I mean, there's all these things going on. And we and do you say the rank and file are the good people? The, it's the admin. We don't know, and unfortunately, that's a problem. I mean, I we want to trust these companies. We want to trust these government agencies. We all know that they're probably doing something they shouldn't. I mean, I watch enough TV to know that. But maybe we can be a little more not discreet about it. Maybe we don't have to look up our ex lovers, like. Right. I, I, you'd think there would be just a modicum of discretion used with a tool like that. But uh, apparently there's not. Uh, the general advice that I have been given in the past is um, uh, rule number one, uh, you don't talk to the cops. Rule number two, you don't talk to the cops. Uh, and rule number three, get yourself a lawyer. Oh, and don't talk to the cops. Mm-hmm. Those are the rules. I mean, I would like to think that... That if I'm doing nothing wrong, I'm not getting the FBI at my door. I would like to think that too. And I would like to believe that that our best uh, law enforcement is the FBI and you don't want to mess with them or the CIA or the NSA. And their job is to keep us all safe without infringing on our rights. I mean, I would hope so. Uh, one one could or, hope like, yes if like if in order to protect my rights a little bit of my phone conversation that they heard when i was when i was in a foreign country and they heard about it and like they accidentally got it up like i'm kind of okay with that as long as they knew that it was accidental they look don't look at it but turns out it's like all of this is fair game yeah so. it's um uh, it's it's surprising and not surprising all at the same time, right? Because at, at the end of the day, these are people, and there are going to be some virtuous people, right? There, there are going to be, you know, some really good FBI agents that always filled out the warrant form and used it, you know, with it just the the most perfect amount of privacy respecting and and respect for the badge that they could have. Uh, and then you've got people that just don't care, right? Um, we've seen this with various law enforcement stories over the past, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 years, uh, where there are some people who are going to be great and there are some people who are going to be terrible. And at the end of the day, they're just people. So maybe instead of making a warrant field optional, you should have it be mandatory and audited or and checked against a, a predefined list of selectors that they might be able to go after. Right. Maybe we could make the system help them do the right thing instead of leaving it up to human judgment. We, I mean, I would hope that the rank and file of the FBI are there. The reason they're violating our rights is because they're, they're going after somebody that's really important and it's going to save the world and everything else. But I guess not. And at, at the end of the day, it's important to understand that, um, if law enforcement gets caught procuring evidence in an illegal manner, the evidence is thrown out of court. They could actually invalidate an entire investigation, an entire court case. Uh, they, they could invalidate everything. And horrible criminals could go free because law enforcement didn't do their job properly and didn't do their job legally. So if you're in law enforcement out there, it's super important to do your job thoroughly, but it's it, more importantly, legally. Because you certainly don't want to get your stuff thrown out of the courthouse because you messed up something. And then it goes back to, it's, I mean, we talk about this all the time. There, People are trying to talk about breaking encryption. And that's a topic for another conversation with the Cloud Act and everything else. And it turns out that most of the time, it's just good police work that catches people. It's the criminal doing something wrong or, uh, or the police 
connecting the dots in some weird way. It's not that they're 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 stealing evidence or they're they're violating these warrants. So it's just do good police work and the bad guys will do something strange. It is really hard to be 100% secure all the time against the best tools of the nation states. And and let's be real, most criminals are idiots, right? I mean there's there's a reason that people still run from the police today. Um yeah, there's you you don't get away from the police. That's that's not a thing that happens. When you run, you know, 99.9% of the time, you're getting taken down. But people still do it and it astounds me. They have a helicopter. I mean, it's like <laughs> Yeah. What what are you going to do, right? They they've, they've mean... got literal tanks, they've got SUVs, they've got uh, you know, Mustangs and other other race cars and they're all souped up and, you know, they can fly. You can't. What are you going to do? Hop a fence? Yeah, good luck, buddy. I mean, I love that. OJ, I mean, OJ still got caught. I mean, it, at 25 miles an hour, whatever it is, he still got caught. So, I don't know. But again, there is no punishment other than this data. But we don't know how, if I'm brought up in court, I don't know where they got this data. And it's real. How's my lawyer going to fight this to say that this was obtained illegally? It's just another smear that puts doubt into the FBI or the other uh, law enforcement agencies. So, yeah, the the other issue, which you, you brought up a great point, is, you know, how do you know if you're part of one of these illegal searches? Right. Uh, Because this was held in a secret court with secret judges on a secret trial and everything is super secret, you will never know, right? Let's say you were materially impacted by this, but you can't prove it because the evidence is locked away. You literally have no recourse. Um, I am 100% against the very thought, the very notion of a secret courtroom. Uh, It is antithetical to American democracy, but that's another conversation for another day. And I agree with you on exactly that. And I guess while we're talking about the FBI and law enforcement, let's get into, I just added this in the the show notes. Um, California signed a bill today that will allow, what won't allow face recognition services for the next three years. So I guess the EFF was pushing hard. We we talked about uh, license plate readers and we talked about face recognition. And now they signed a bill that law enforcement cannot use face recognition directly against you in finding you as or IDing you for the next three years. So I guess this is a really big win for privacy advocates. I just don't know where the three years came from. I don't know why it was three years and not indefinitely, but... I guess this is let's let's start. We have three more years now to argue this. Yeah, the the three years is interesting to me. Maybe maybe it was a side effect of you know uh, facial recognition being good, but not it's not perfect. No one have, is ever going to claim it's perfect, right? Um, it does an okay job, but there's also based on training data sets, um, there is an inherent bias when it comes to race in most facial recognition applications, simply because. A decent amount of these were trained on data sets that weren't very diverse. Um, So it will commonly mistake people of color for other people just because the AI has not had enough training data for that particular segment of the population. Um, It's completely unfortunate. And maybe the three years is that kind of side effect, right? In three years, we'll see if we're there yet. I don't think it is. Um, and, And personally, I the technology is interesting, but I don't think we should use it as, for something as important as police work yet. Um, you know, I, I barely believe that it's even appropriate to use boarding an aircraft. Uh, and I know Delta Airlines has been trialing that, and it's kind of unnerving, really. Um, but we'll see. Um, in any case, uh, I, I am with the EFF on this one. Um, I think that facial recognition does not does not belong in police work right now maybe to you know slim down a a list sure uh but to be able to pinpoint someone and say yes this person in this video on this feed based on this application is definitely this person no that's a bridge too far we can't do that it's that what i when i hear this that they're using face recognition and going after criminals this way in new jersey they ruled that red light cameras were unconstitutional because every 
So a yellow light is supposed to be one second for every 10 miles per hour of the speed limit. So if you have 50 miles per hour, it's supposed to be five seconds. So they rated it unconstitutional because the testing of the lights were never timed correctly. So these cameras were taking where the red lights were, the yellow lights were changing too quick to red. And then the cameras were going after people. And after many years and enough cases, the judge just basically said, look, until you get your act together, this is done. And you cannot use this. It's now unconstitutional. Also because you can't face your accuser because it's a machine. But it was just kind of funny like that, that they had this fairly simple job of timing the lights and they couldn't do that. And I, I mean, I... I, mean, I, I think I can say, well, it's times 10 of the speed limit and we'll make it, but they couldn't do it. And and so I can see the same thing, like you said, with facial recognition. Maybe they're, maybe we're at 50% accuracy, but somebody's going to ride their entire case and the public defender is not going to be able to defend against it. And people are going to go to jail when they're probably completely innocent. Yeah, it's... Um... Ohio actually had a, a similar uh, measure with their red light cameras because somebody quite correctly uh, demanded to face their accuser uh, in traffic court. And the judge couldn't unbolt the traffic cam and sit on the bench and have it, you know, give testimony. Uh, so they were quickly ruled illegal uh, in American law. Um, if you go to court, if you're given a citation, if you go to trial, you have the legal right to face your accuser. Uh, it's to prevent somebody from claiming you did something and then sulking off to the shadows somewhere and then you having to defend against a body of evidence and a person that you've never seen before. It's, it's to prevent, uh, you know, kangaroo courts. Um, and it's, it's really nice for things like this where a traffic camera, you know, claimed you did something, um, but you might not have, right? How, how do they know? Now, if a if uh, a, an officer pulls you over, looks at your ID, matches your license plate, looks you in the eyes, writes you the ticket and hands it to you, totally different. You are absolutely going to face that officer in the court of law. But a speed camera, not necessarily. It's, I remember my wife got a, what is it? A, got a red light ticket for that many, many years before this happened. And I think she brought that up. My wife is an attorney and she didn't bring that up. And there were, they got out, they, they had some excuse that they, there was some legal case that said, oh, it was, uh, here is the officer who, who reviewed your case. So, again, I don't remember what happened, but again, these uh, red light cameras are now ruled unconstitutional. And I have a feeling it's partly on the same reason as why these uh, face recognitions are just not good enough yet. With that said, they're going to get better. They will always get better. And and this is probably not the best thing to have. But if it does so solve crime and doesn't get too many false positives, let's revisit this, I guess, in three years, which is what they're saying. Okay, Tom, you want to talk about mixed uh, media content being blocked? Sure. So um, back in the day, you might have seen, uh, especially on Internet Explorer, it was pretty famous for throwing uh, a mixed content warning message. You get a big pop up and say, this page is using mixed content. Um, and what that basically means is that some portions of the page were using HTTPS and some portions were using HTTP. Some portions were secure, some portions were insecure. Uh, Chrome said, yeah, we're, we're not gonna do mixed content anymore. Sorry, the glory days are over. You can no longer mix secure and insecure resources on the same page. Uh, so coming up in trying to get the version number here, um, Chrome is going so, to gradually start uh, ensuring that HTTPS pages will only load HTTPS resources. Um, Chrome 79 uh, released into the stable channel in December 2019. Uh, they're going to introduce a new setting. Um, Chrome 80, uh, mixed images will be allowed, uh, but they will show a not secure. Um, Chrome 81, uh, mixed images will be automatically upgraded and they will, uh, they will absolutely block any mixed content uh, if they fail to load over HTTPS. This is fantastic. This is, this is great. It's, at this point, I don't know too many websites that are not HTTPS. So I mean it's I mean it's it's long time coming. So I don't know too many websites that are not HTTPS, and I know that a lot of the ad serving companies try. I mean 
they don't want to become secure, but this is going to start forcing them to start doing it. Yeah, I, I think this is this is great for a lot of reasons. Um, there are still image and web and code and CDN hosts and a bunch of places that are only serving traffic over HTTP. You don't have the option to upgrade. What this will do is it means uh, for Chrome 81, if if you're trying to serve mixed content, your site's just not going to work. It's just going to fail. Um, this is this is fantastic. The the danger of serving mixed content, um, like it, you can imagine, serving mixed JavaScript. Oh, clearly that's an issue, right? Because you are allowing uh, allowing an executable resource to be man in the middle on your secure page. Clearly a no no. Images, hmm. What could you do with an image? Well, let's say you have a a button, uh, you know, a, and it's using a background image for styling. It, people still do that. Um, and it says deposit money or withdraw money. Um, if it's loaded over an insecure resource, you can just switch that to deposit, right? You can make the user do awful things that they weren't expecting because you're changing images in the background through a man in the middle attack. Um, so mixed content, absolutely an issue. So do you want to talk about iTerm? Oh, you're muted. I am muted. I thought I hit that button. So, um, iTerm. Uh, if any of you are Mac users and you're using iTerm 2, um, go check for updates. You should have gotten an update notification already uh, because it's built into the application. Um, but uh, there was kind of a critical vulnerability that uh, would allow uh, basically high risk targets, um, developers, sysadmins, people like that, uh, to get hacked through. Um, you had some pretty nefarious means. Um, it, it's basically, it could be exploited via commands generally considered safe. It's what they're saying here. Um, Mozilla notified the iTerm2 developer. Apparently the uh, vulnerability has been around for about seven years um, and uh, the, the dev fixed it almost immediately. Like it was Johnny on the spot right there. So if you have iTerm2, uh, download the update, uh, it'll be good. That's about it. Okay. I, I don't use iTerm2, but like you said, it's a lot of uh, power users. So if that's you, let's uh, go up. At this point, we're over time. We covered a whole bunch of stories that were quick, and we didn't finish all of them. So I don't know if we'll push up to next week, but we'll see. Anyway, everyone, have a good night. We will see you hopefully next week. See you, everyone. Bye. All right, I've stopped Audacity. I am now stopping Twitch.